Good morning, students. In this lecture, we will talk about the differentiation of the mesoderm. And as a part of the mesoderm, we will talk also about the formation of the muscular system, not only the skeletal muscle, muscle but all muscle tissues. Here you see an embryo, head process, the pharyngeal arches, first two pharyngeal arches, the heart primordium, and along the midline of the embryo, up to the tail portion, there you see the small balls, units. These are parts of the paraxial mesoderm, the so-called somites, which here in this case are covered with the ectodermal layer. This was a figure that I showed you already before, and I told you to follow the blue ectodermal layer, where the neural plate appeared, tended to close, and finally it closed and separated from the surface ectoderm, which will be the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium. If you follow the layer, which is on the bottom of this trilaminar germ disc, that's the endoderm, then first, parallelly with these processes in the ectoderm, nothing happens here, not very specifically, but at the end, it will be involved into the body of the uh, embryo. Uh, the, if we make our cut in the so-called mid-gut territory, then you see the white connection with the York sac. But you see that here this is already bulging in into the future body of the embryo. And if now we follow the middle layer, this red marked mesodermal layer, then parallelly with the previously described processes, you see that the medial part will enlarge. This will be the paraxial mesodermal territory. And here, laterally, you see little gaps appearing. Then these gaps will fuse, and they will give a cavity. This will be the intraembryonic salom, body cavity. And at the end, when the neural tube closes, then on the border between the paraxial and the lateral plate mesoderm, a new territory arrive, uh, appears. Uh, which we call the intermediate mesoderm. So this is our next topic that we will talk about these differentiation processes. Uh, with the gastrulation, we explained how the mesodermal layer was formed. And if we make a, a drawing, a, spe a special drawing from the trilaminar germ disk, then you see that the mesodermal layer here, which is the intraembryonic part of the mesoderm, that gets in contact with the extraembryonic central mesoderm here. So if we would let a little ant into this groove, then the, the little ant could walk around this line all along. Right? And now, in this phase of the development, what this drawing shows, this is here, this territory is here, the <coughs> extraembryonic salome. Later, these two plates will also open up, forming the intraembryonic salome. So the intraembryonic salome will be also in connection widely all along uh, around the edge of the trilaminar germ disk with the extraembryonic salome. And please don't forget that here is the heart primordium between the bucopharyngeal membrane and the edge of the trilaminar germ disk. This uh, border between the gray ectoderm and the yellow amnion, this oval border that marks the border of the trilaminar germ disk. This was the figure that I showed you in the previous uh, lectures already, how the extraembryonic mesoderm was formed. Uh, and at that time, we only had the bilaminar germ disk, the epiblast and the hyperblast. And now with the gastrulation, a third uh, layer appeared. And now we have already the trilaminar germ disk. And we may call this upper layer ectoderm this middle one, the mesoderm, and this lower one, the endoderm. And please do not forget that all three germ layers are derived from the epiblast. Now we will deal with this mesodermal layer. Again, the cross-sections of those figures that I've shown already previously, what are the proper names? This is here the peripheral mesoderm, and the peripheral mesoderm has a somatopleura, and it has a splanchnopleura. This is the intraembryonic mesoderm. They get in contact with each other. Right? In the middle, we also have the axial mesoderm. That's the corda dorsalis, not a cord. And the medial territory thickens. That we call the paraaxial mesoderm. It's next to the axis. And in the lateral plate mesoderm, as in all tissues which are 
uh, firm tissues with no proper blood supply, holes will appear. That's what you see also here. Here you have little gaps appearing. On this picture, you already see the forming dorsal aorta. This is already a sign for that, that the blood circulation will also begin in the, in the embryo. These little holes on the edge, they fused with each other, forming the intraembryonic uh, salomic cavity, which is in connection with the extraembryonic salomic cavity. And at the end, the all major parts of the mesoderm are established, like the paraxial mesoderm, <coughs> the intermediate mesoderm, and the two layers of the lateral plate mesoderm. These are also called somatopleura and splanchnopleura. So the, we, have, we have here the same names, and at this stage you always have to add whether you are talking about the intraembryonic or the extraembryonic mesoderm. They are, of course, continuous with each other. So this is here the intraembryonic somatopleura and extraembryonic somatopleura. Intraembryonic splanchnopleura and extraembryonic splanchnopleura. If we make scanning electron microscopic pictures uh, of the, at this stage, then we see once the neural tube, right? Here it's colored, it's not colored, that I showed you already previously. This surface is here, the ectoderm. This lower surface is here, the endoderm. And between these two uh, layers, you see kind of like the jelly in the sandwich, uh, the mesodermal layer. This is here, the paraxial mesoderm. And here you see the two plates of the lateral plate mesoderm, somatopleura and splanchnopleura. A little bit later, the neural tube is already closed. Here you see it's closed, that it is closed. Here on the surface, the ectoderm is torn. But under the neural tube here, here it's not colored, there you see a small cross section. This is the notochord. Next to the neural tube, you have the paraxial mesoderm, and you can well observe that here now they look like epithelial cells. That's, a, that's the type, uh, that's the process of the differentiation, that when they merge under, they, are, they look like connective tissue cells, so they have processes, and when they form this paraxial mesoderm, then they are again epithelialized, and they look like epithelial cells. And here you see the lateral plate mesoderm, two layers, somatopleura, splanchnopleura, and in between the cavity, that's the intraembryonic salome. Now, uh, what happens to this paraxial mesoderm? <clears throat> All along uh, the notochord, it uh, begins to form segments. These segments first are uh, not morphological segments, so you do not have these tissue balls. Uh, one could show the borders of the segments due to the factors which are expressed specifically in these segments. Uh, and when, that, when it's not yet uh, forming these little tissue balls, we call them somitomeres. These further, from the occipital region and downward, they will develop into somites, uh, and they will form these special tissue balls. Uh, and these somites, they start to form uh, from day 20, and every day, uh, three new somites will form. At the end, uh, we will have four occipital uh, somites, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and eight to 10 coccygeal uh, somites. Uh, when I ask in the lecture the students that what do these numbers you remind, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, remind you of, then you usually tell that it's kind of like the vertebral column. But it's not exactly the vertebral column, because in the, in the cervical region, we only have seven vertebrae. It's more like the segments of the spinal cord, because the spinal cord segmentation kept the original pattern of the segments. Uh, you will see at the end of the lecture that the, uh, the vertebrae are shifted with, with a half segment. Uh, uh, the permanent vertebrae are actually in between, always in between two actual segments. And so then we lose one segment in the cervical region. But you have eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral. So the somites are also somites. They belong to the mesoderm. And next to the mesoderm, in the middle, you have the neural tube, which comes from the ectoderm. And all this is segmented. So not only the earthworm is segmented, but the human body is also segmented. Please do not forget it. And as I told you, every day, three new 
uh, somites will form. And based on the actual number of somites, these, these days they refer to human development. But if we would look at a mouse, uh, a mouse embryo with a specific, specific number of somites, let's say with 18 somites, a mouse embryo with 18 somites would look very similarly to a human embryo with 18 somites. And sometimes in the books you have also illustrations uh, taken from, uh, from uh, animals and, and mice or rats and not from human. Okay, so this picture is to summarize what we know already now from the mesoderm, that we have the mesoderm, we have two, two big parts, the extraembryonic mesoderm and the intraembryonic mesoderm. In the extraembryonic mesoderm, you have the central mesoderm, you have the connecting stoke mesoderm and the chorionic mesoderm on the periphery. Uh, the intraembryonic mesoderm is divided into the axial mesoderm, that's the notochord, the paraxial mesoderm, the intermediate mesoderm, and the lateral plate mesoderm, which has then the somatopleura and the splanchnopleura. And if now we deal only with the paraxial mesoderm, from the paraxial mesoderm in the coming pictures, I will explain how it divides into the so-called dermomyotome, and into the sclerotome. The dermomyotome will later be divided into dermatome and to myotome. Every somite already at this developmental uh, stage and also the, uh, the connecting other structures which run them parallelly and they are not morphologically segmented, they are connected with a, a spinal uh, nerve which comes from a specific segment of the spinal cord. This is very important, this connection, because without innervation, the periphery doesn't develop, and if the periphery doesn't exist, then the central nervous system doesn't uh, develop. So they have a vice versa uh, play onto each other and regulating function. Uh, this connection also explains that where the muscles get the innervation from, from this term, myotome from where which then all skeletal muscles are derived from the myotome we will see. So at this early stage the somite is connected with a nerve. In the somite you will have the myotome cells. From the myotome cells we have the skeletal muscle and these are always innervated by the connected spinal nerve or branches of that spinal nerve. Sometimes of course these uh, uh, spinal nerves they unite to form uh, the plexus is like a brachial plexus, uh, lumbar plexus, etc. Uh, but, but even then you can follow back uh, the segmental innervation. Just some illustration, right? Head process, pharyngeal arches, heart primordium, and here you have the somites. On this picture, this picture from a territory here, the ectoderm is removed. And if the ectoderm is removed, then you see these actual tissue balls of the somites and they have borders between them. And uh, this is a drawing which is similar uh, to this, although here we already have three uh, pharyngeal arches. And then, uh, now I will make this picture, this drawn picture disappear. And then we have here a true embryo where you see the brain vesicles here, they're a little bit transparent. You see the dorsal aorta, you see the heart primordium, you see the liver primordium here, and here in the back you see these fine borders. Actually, the borders are given by vessels, and in between these territories, these are here the somites. Okay, so let's follow then what happens exactly in this paraxial mesoderm. So this was here the paraxial mesoderm, uh, consisting of epithelial-like cells. I told you that first they were fibrocyte-like, and then later they become epitheloid cells, even a hole will appear here in the middle. And this is the paraxial meso uh, mesoderm, uh, the somite at the earliest stage. Uh, what will happen next? That the ventral cells of this territory, they will detach. They will be again uh, like connective tissue cells with processes. Uh, these are the so-called sclerotome cells and the sclerotome cells will form cartilage, bone, and tendon also. Uh, most uh, uh, of the, uh, some of these sclerotome cells, they will migrate uh, ventrally and they will surround the notochord. Others, they will walk, uh, they will migrate uh, laterally. Uh, the other part of the paraxial mesoderm, 
the dermomyotome uh, that kept yet its uh, original epithelial-like appearance, and uh, the two edges, they will start to proliferate. These two edges, they will be the ventral, uh, the uh, dorsal medial lip, dorsal medial lip, and the ventrolateral lip of this territory, and these will be uh, the myotome cells. The ones which are in the middle, here again, they detach and they will become connective tissue-like cells, and these will give uh, the dermis of the back, the dermis that's the connective tissue layer of the skin. So this will, these cells will give the connective tissue layers, truly the histological dermis and also the underlying connective tissue, subcutaneous connective tissue, but only in the back region. Uh, those territories, in those territories, which are uh, innervated by the dorsal branches of the spinal nerves. Uh, the segmental innervation, it's also a very important fact to know about. Uh, even if we don't ask you precisely the segmental innervation uh, in, in the exam, in the anatomy exam, you have to know the logic of it. Uh, and the logic is based on that, that initially, at the earliest phase of the development, one spinal segment is already connected with one uh, mesodermal segment, which consists of the uh, somite, that's morphologically also a segment, and the lateral territories, which are not segmented morphologically. And everything what is derived from these territories are innervated by this proper segmental nerve. Uh, here, uh, you know that the upper limb is innervated by the, uh, by the brachial plexus, right? And the brachial plexus, that's from C5 uh, to thoracic one. And here now you can see that, of course, if you imagine the forelegged position, then, of course, the thumb must get uh, 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 branches from higher segment than the, uh, than the little finger, right? And the axilla must get uh, branches from lower segment as the shoulder territory. Uh, so if you follow this logic, then and if you go back with the, with the specific nerves, which are branches of the brachial plexus, like radial, ulnar, median, etc., if you follow backward, then you can get back to the segment, that from which segment they are connected, and you will see this strip-like uh, pattern. And uh, here you have to be careful because for these strips of skin, that these are also called dermatome. That's, we use the same word, unfortunately, uh, for these cells, which detach here and give in a certain territory the connective tissue layers of the skin. That's one meaning of the word. But if you are speaking uh, in connection with the skin innervation about a dermatome, that's the entire stripe here. Right? Why is this important? You will see that uh, the uh, herpes zoster, it's a kind of like a disease which is hidden in the, in the body of those who had smallpox. And they, uh, it appears along one dermatome, which is then a superficial stripe of the skin. Okay. So we are there that we had originally the paraxial mesoderm, and now we have the dermatome, the myotome, and the sclerotome established from that. Uh, what happens with the intermediate mesoderm? Another name, an older name for this, was the gononephrotome. Uh, I, it's worth to remember this name, this gononephrotome, because it refers to that, that this will give uh, uh, the uh, tubes and parts of the gonadal system of the uh, of the uh, ducts of the uh, gonadal system, and the nephrotome refers to that, that it will be in, co in connection with the kidney development. Uh, this intermediate mesoderm uh, that was segmented in the, upper, uh, uh, in the cervical and in the upper thoracic region, but these segments, they don't play a role uh, later, and the distal part will be not uh, segmented, and that uh, the caudally, that is called this unsegmented territory, the nephrogenic cord, and this nephrogenic cord will give, at the end, the kidney. Kidney development we will discuss in the second the semester. So now you only have to know this much about the intermediate mesoderm. And what is with the lateral plate? The lateral plate has two layers, the parietal mesoderm, here, and the visceral mesoderm, here. Uh, if now you imagine, you see that uh, the visceral plate, for example, it covers the endodermal tube, then you have the body cavity, and then comes the external layer. On the surface, you have here the, the 
uh, skin, the uppermost layer of the skin, the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium. And this picture that is from the midgut, from the midgut, uh, so the cross section is at the level of the midgut. From the midgut, actually, you have this, for example, the small intestine developing. So now let's imagine that you pierce through your body wall. What do you go first through? You go through your skin and the epithelium of your skin. Then you go through the underlying connective tissue that is derived from this lateral plate mesoderm. Then you have the muscles of your body wall, right? The muscles will migrate in, the myotome cells will migrate in from the paraxial mesoderm. And the innermost layer of your body wall before you reach the peritoneal cavity, that will be the peritoneum, the serous membrane. So this gray layer here, the innermost layer of this uh, parietal mesoderm, that will be the peritoneum. Then you are in the peritoneal cavity, and then you reach the surface of a bowel, a small intestine, that you saw in the slides on the, already on the second week. So it's worth to go back to that slide and look at that, what tissues did you find there. On the external surface, you had a mesothelial layer. That's the visceral layer of the peritoneum. Uh, one layer of the visceral mesoderm. Then in the wall of the small intestine, you have connective tissue elements, smooth muscle elements. That is all derived from this visceral mesoderm. And the innermost layer, the, uh, the simple columnar epithelium with striated border and with the goblet cells, and there are also some small glands connected to it, that is all derived from the endoderm. Okay, so please follow this logic and imagine that how you go through your body wall into the lumen of the intestine, and please remember that from which germ layer they come from. Again, we have parallel events. I already told about that, uh, that first in the extramuronic mesoderm, uh, blood islets will appear. This starts with the so-called angioblasts, and the angioblasts will differentiate into endothelial cells, simple squamous epithelium, and the blood cells. And a few days later, as the gastrulation allows it, that there is already mesoderm in the, in, inside the embryo, there also blood islets will appear, and these will get connected to each other, and we have a primitive uh, circulation, already a primitive placental circulation, at the beginning of the fourth week. The heart will start to beat at the first day of the fourth, fourth week, on day 21, 10, 22. And now we will talk about the muscular system and about the muscle tissues. Uh, all muscles develop from the mesoderm. This is kind of like a basic rule. It's good if you remember it like this. And then, as always in biology, we have some small exceptions. But the basic rule is that if you hear the term muscle, muscle tissue, then you connect it with the mesoderm. From the paraaxial mesoderm, we have the myotome cells. We describe them. Skele all skeletal muscles, they come from the myotome. From the visceral mesoderm, here, you have the smooth muscle in the wall of the viscera. And you also have the heart muscle, derived from this visceral uh, layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. And it's interesting, you remember, that the heart muscle is also striated, and the skeletal muscle is also striated. So histologically, the two, although they come from different directions, uh, histologically, they are kind of uh, similar. Now, where else do we have smooth muscles? So these are the main parts of, the, of, of skeletal muscle and of the smooth muscle. But smooth muscle we have also in other territories, like in the wall of the aorta and the coronary arteries. Uh, there also neural crest cells contribute, right? I told you that the septum of the heart develops from this ectomesenchyme, from neural crest. So with that also, smooth muscle formation is possible. In general, the smooth muscle in the wall of the blood vessels always comes from the surrounding mesenchyme, mostly that is the mesoderm. Uh, the mesenchyme mostly comes from the mesoderm, but in the head and neck region, it's the ectomesenchyme, so in the head and neck region, the blood vessels, uh, the, uh, the, the histological uh, uh, elements in the, in the wall of the blood vessels, they come from this ectomesenchyme. And uh, that small uh, smooth muscle bundle, which is next to the uh, sebaceous glands, the musculus erector pili, that comes also from the dermis of the skin, so always from the uh, appropriate surrounding. 
This is a very important sentence. I will stress it yet a few times. The shape of the muscles is defined by the surrounding connective tissue, and this process is called the patterning. Without patterning from the myotome cells, you don't get the, uh, the skeletal muscle. You need to have the proper connective tissue surrounding and also the myotome cells, because the myotome cells will give the skeletal muscle cells, but they, this transition doesn't happen without the proper uh, patterning. So you have to know that what is the surrounding, where does the connect, surrounding connective tissue come from, because that will give the patterning. Right? Where, what is then the origin of the connective tissue in the surrounding of the, of the muscles? Uh, in the back of, the, uh, of our body, uh, that's the dermatome, which is a part of the paraxial mesoderm. In the body wall and in the limbs, it will be the lateral plate mesoderm here, the parietal layer of the lateral plate mesoderm. And in the craniofacial territories, it will be the ectomesenchyme, which is a mixture of the mesoderm and the neural crest. Right? And this is extremely important to know this, that where the, where the connective tissues originate from, which give the patterning for the myotome cells. Here I listed a few exceptions. You shouldn't deal with this in this semester, but when you get to the final exam, then you will have to know already also these smaller details. Okay, important. Don't forget this, please. So then how do then skeletal muscles form? We have the myotome cells, a part of the, uh, of the somites. These will uh, differentiate to so-called myoblasts. Then they fuse with each other, and we get a multinucleated giant cells. First, we call these the myotube. Within the myotube, the, the nuclei are yet uh, evenly scattered everywhere in the cytoplasm, and there is no definite cross striation. Uh, at the end of uh, about in the, in the third month, uh, these myotubes will form uh, the muscle fibers. In the muscle fiber, the nucleus is already at the periphery. The cross, tri cross striation is established, and on the surface there is a basement membrane. Right? This is a muscle fiber. What is a muscle fiber actually? It is a multinucleated giant cell. And here please consider that what the term fiber means. Uh, the fiber means only that something is long and thin. Okay? And we, in histological terms we use it uh, from different, uh, for different reasons uh, to describe something with the term fiber because we have the muscle fiber, which is a multinucleated giant cell. We have the connective tissue fibers, which belong to the extracellular matrix. And we, you will learn about the nerve fibers, which are the axons of the nerve cells surrounded by uh, their sheath. Right? So it's, uh, always we use the term fiber, but they are very different things. Now let's see that what, uh, what happens with these uh, uh, myotome cells. This is the traditional description that some of the myotome cells migrate dorsally, and we call these territories the epaxial muscles, and some of them migrate ventrally, and we call them hypaxial muscles. Uh, the epaxial muscles are described by the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves, and the hypaxial muscles are, uh, in, uh, are innervated by the ventral rami of the spine, uh, spinal nerves. Uh, as they migrate ventrally, initially they form three layers. These three layers are very well kept in the uh, wall of the abdominal cavity, uh, like the external and the internal oblique and the transverse uh, muscle. And somewhat they are kept also in the thoracic cavity because you don't only have an outer and an inner intercostal muscle, but you have also an innermost, which is a very thin and weak layer. But it's the remnant of these three layers which migrated uh, ventrally. Plus, at the level of the, of the, uh, of the uh, limbs, from certain segments, uh, tissues will pull out. They kind of like the skin. The, the ectoderm kind of like pushes out the mesoderm, right? In, the, in your limbs, you don't have anything that is endodermal. You only have ectodermal structures, like the, uh, the epithelium on the surface, glands, hair, etc., and the nerves, those are ectodermal. And inside, you have uh, all mesodermal structures, like bones, tendons, muscles, vessels, etc. 
So they pull out from a specific segment, but because they were initially already connected with the spinal uh, segments and the, the spinal nerves, the innervation is kept. So you see that the upper limb is innervated by the brachial plexus and the lower limb is innervated on its anterior surface uh, from the lumbar plexus and on the dorsal surface by the sacral plexus. Basically, that's so true. Okay, so this is then the functional classification, what I told about so far, epoxial. Uh, they are called also epimere with another term and hypoxial. These may be also called hypomere. Unfortunately, we have synonyms. And uh, these are innervated here by the ventral rami and these are innervated by the dorsal rami. But we also have a classification according to the embryological origin. I told you with the myotome cells that we had a dorsomedial lip and a ventral, uh, ventrolateral lip. And we, with these, uh, uh, in these territories, we have a primaxial and an abaxial uh, region. What is that exactly? That we have a so-called lateral somatic frontier. This territory here, uh, this is the primaxial domain, and this is here the abaxial domain. And I told you that the patterning is very important, and we have to know that where the connective tissue comes from which does the patterning. The patterning here in the primaxial domain that comes from the dermatome part of the, uh, of the somite. Uh, the connective tissue in the abaxial domain comes from the parietal plate of the mesoderm. This is here the parietal plate of the mesoderm. Here also this is the parietal plate of the lateral mesoderm. Uh, there are also lots of factors here which work together and, and uh, do the, uh, the correct sequence of these happenings. You don't have to know the names of the factors. You only have to know that we have factors that have the effect properly. Okay, so what we know now that we have the primaxial domain and the abaxial domain. And what happens that the cells of the dorsomedial lip, uh, they, they will remain here in the primaxial domain. But Partially, those cells which are here in the ventrolateral domain, they will step over this lateral somatic frontier and they will invade these lateral territories. But within these lateral territories, the parietal mesoderm will give the patterning. The other part of these cells, pardon, the other part of these cells from this ventrolateral lip remains in this territory, in this primaxial domain. For those, then the dermis will give the patterning. Okay, in this picture, I summarized in sentences what I just told you, uh, so I won't read this again, with some examples for the muscles, you may read that, right? Uh, the important is that primaxial domain, uh, the patterning is the dermatome mesenchyme, abaxial domain patterning from the lateral plate uh, mesoderm. And we have to talk a little bit from the scleraxis, from the sclerotome cells. Uh, now, this uh, scleraxis is the factor that influences the development of the sclerotome cells, and the sclerotome cells do a similar migration like what we saw with the myotome cells. And uh, uh, when you think about uh, anatomy and the muscles, then in your imagination you have the muscle belly, and it goes over to the tendon, and the tendon is attached to a bone. And in your anatomical mind, uh, the border is between the tendon and the bone. But if now you think the embryologic er origin and about the, uh, the histological uh, connection, then the bone that belongs to the connective and supportive tissue group, you know that at the insertion you have the fibrous uh, cartilage that's also uh, supporting tissue, and then you have a dense connective tissue, which is obviously a connective tissue, and then it connects to the muscle. So uh, embryologically and histologically, the border between the basic parts of a muscle is there where the, uh, where the tendon connects to the muscle tissue. And uh, this is provided by the, uh, so the tendons are, are formed by the sclerotome and they need the influence of the scleraxis and the, the sclerotome cells, they do a similar migration like what, what I described with the myotome cells. Uh, this table you don't have to learn. It's, I just, uh, I'm just showing that in the head uh, region where we had the somitomeres, somitomeres, they also have myotome parts, just they are not falling apart into morphological somites. 
and we have also the occipital somites. These, the myotome parts of these segments will give uh, the eye muscles, my, uh, muscles of mastication, facial expression, uh, larynx and tongue, some other muscles. So all those muscles which are innervated by the cranial nerves. And for, uh, for these muscles, the patterning is given in the head and neck region by the ectomesenchyme, which is from the lateral pl uh, plate mesoderm partially and partially from neural clusters. Uh, this is also only an example that we are talking about frontiers, we are talking about abaxial, primaxial domain, and you might think that this is a fairy tale, but of course this is based on science, and here I found an article where with a special histological technique, these uh, territories like the primaxial and the abaxial domains could be visualized also in histological slides. And now shortly about the development of the vertebral column. So I told you that the, from the, from the uh, somites, the ventral cells, they detach and they migrate ventrally, at least some of them, the sclerotome cells, and they will form the primitive vertebrae around the notochord. So this is here a primitive vertebra. And at this level, the spinal nerve is in the middle of, of this primitive vertebra. Now, uh, these segments will be reorganized. Uh, that the lower half of a segment is always united with the upper half of, of, the, uh, of the primitive vertebra that is below. And here, uh, in the middle of an original primitive vertebra, then the intervertebral disc will form. And through the, uh, originally, in the middle of the entire vertebral column, uh, the corda dorsalis was running through. And uh, at the end, we say that the remnant of the corta dorsalis is the nucleus pulposus in the middle of the intervertebral disc, what is shown by these spots here. And as the vertebrae are reorganized and shifted with half vertebra, that's how we lose one vertebra, one segment in the uh, vertebral column in the cervical region, and we have only seven vertebrae. So with this shift, then uh, the nerves are already not in the middle of the primitive vertebra, but they are in between two uh, vertebrae, so they may step out, so to say. And uh, yes, that's it. And originally, we had uh, the, myot the, the most primitive ancient muscles, they were within one segment. That is shown here. And you, can, you will learn uh, with the axial musculature that uh, even at the uh, permanent muscle uh, systems and levels we have on the, in the deepest layer, we have uh, a, a group of muscles which just, just bridge over between two vertebrae, so they are just in, with the, connect two, uh, two, two vertebrae. So that's how uh, they can connect two vertebrae that uh, the segment was shifted and they are already not within one vertebra, but bet between two vertebrae. Uh, okay, so this is then the development of the vertebral column. Okay. And now let's summarize that what, what is derived from all three germ layers on this picture. Ectodermal is the epidermis and its appendices, like hair, nails, glands, etc. Uh, neural crest and the placodes, the detailed list you saw in the previous lecture. And the central and the peripheral nervous system. That is everything ectodermal. Mesodermal are the connective and the supportive tissues, with the exception of the, of, the, uh, of the ectomesenchyme that comes from the neural crest. All muscles, the heart and the entire circulatory system, including the lymph vessels and the spleen, most of the urogenital tract, and the cortex of the suprarenal gland, because the medulla, we listed it with the derivatives of the neural crest. What is endodermal? Like our body is a tube, right? You don't, rem uh, don't forget it. So lining of the intestinal and the respiratory tract, parenchyma of the thyroid, parathyroid uh, glands, and of the liver and the pancreas, the lining of the urethra and the bladder, that's also endodermal, and the lining of the tympanic cavity and the auditory tube, which opens into the pharynx. So these are the endodermal structures, and these are all epithelial structures you see here. And on this last picture, I would like to summarize uh, that uh, to, to, to have a guidance for you to imagine that what develops from what in which direction. We can do that in two directions. That we ask that where do the basic tissues originate from? 
epithelia, they may derive from the ectoderm, from the mesoderm, and also from the endoderm. Connective and supportive tissues, they are mostly from the mesoderm, but in the head and neck region, they come also from the ectoderm through the neural crest. Muscle tissues, they come from the mesoderm. And the nervous tissue, that comes always from the ectoderm. Now, if we give another question, that what are the derivatives, what basic tissues may be the derivatives of the germ layers? From the ectoderm, you may have epithelia, you may have connective and supportive tissue only in the head and neck region through the neural crest, ectomesenchyme, and you may have nervous tissue. Uh, from the mesoderm, you may have epithelia, connective and supportive tissue, and, mu and muscle tissue. And from the endoderm, you may have only epithelial structures. This may be surface epithelia or granular epithelia. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>